Good afternoon and welcome to the Chartreuse Leprechaun. My name is Mark, your host, and it's time again for our monthly-ish channel technical personal update. Uh, time hacks will be in the sections, or time, time hacks for all the sections will be in the description below. Uh, in case you want to skip around, this is going to be a long one because I, you know, I promised you an update on surgery and all of that. So uh, that's going to be in here. So uh yeah, so my throat's a little raw, my voice is a little off, uh, I've still got a bandage on. Normally when we do these videos, we do them with background music. And normally I go off cam and I add that in the post-production process. Well, this time I'm actually revealing the music we'll be using now. Now it's listed in, on the right side of the screen. Sorry about that, I just hit the, uh, hit the boom with my right hand. It's listed on the screen on the right, though not necessarily in the order I'll use them, and there may actually be stuff in there I don't use. Now, I'm still going to add it all in in post-production, trim to fit, and all of that, and the final playlist will be in the description below when, uh, when you see it. So, why are we doing this, you ask? Well, that's a great question. Today, we're using tracks from someone a subscriber told me about. Now, her username slash handle slash whatever you call it is eBunny. And I have a link to her YouTube channel in the comments below. She makes some good stuff. And the reason I bring this up is I'm supporting her on Patreon. And I say that to announce that the Chartreuse Leprechaun now has a page on Patreon. And as you know, I am experimenting with all things streaming and YouTube-ish. So this page is another piece of that experiment. There's no supporter levels or benefits or... Um, uh, none of that has been set up. It's very much a work in progress. I don't know how far I'm going to go with this thing. I hope it becomes a real thing, uh, support and all of that. I'll be doing more and more there as time goes on. But as of right now, yeah, not much more than a profile. Uh, so leave your thoughts in the comments below, please. Uh, tier benefits, pricing, thoughts, uh, content, all that fun stuff. I've got some ideas of my own, of course, but I would love to have your thoughts as well. You guys, uh, you guys may think of things I didn't. Now, about today's video, I normally end with the personal stuff because, well, that's the bad stuff. Uh, and I always want to save that for last, and then I add a rousing summary of what's going on with the channel, and we end on a high note. But this time, I'm going to start with the personal stuff because, well, that's good and bad stuff, and everything else is pretty much all good stuff. So, so uh, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Set yourself up for notifications so you don't miss anything around here. And let's get started with those medical updates. Now, uh, the surgery we went well, uh, obviously, because, you know, I'm here. So the good news, as of right now, the shooting pain from reaching, grabbing, typing, and so on is improved. Uh, it's not gone. It kind of depends on which muscle area we're talking about, too. But uh, will that remain true? Only time's going to tell. Um, rehab use, sometimes things go south even after a good surgery. Uh, don't know. Uh, the bad news is some areas that were symptom-free six days post-surgery are starting to regress as I use the hand more and more. So, uh, And as expected by every doctor, um, the surgery did nothing to resolve the dystonia issues. Um, it also didn't resolve weakness and fatigue in the in the left forearm and hand. It's possible that we'll recover with time and exercise in a rehab and all of that. Uh, that's questionable, but we'll find out for sure in five weeks when we start rehab. Unfortunately, there are a couple of pretty intense post-surgery effects going on, which is why you see me leaning back in the chair. I've got ice packs, one behind my neck, one behind my back, still, even almost two weeks post-surgery. The first of those intense areas is I guess I'll call it pinpoint pain in, well, it's actually, it's not really pinpoint. It's more widespread than that, but it's in the mid back. Uh, think of your own shoulder and back for a second and follow the shoulder blade across the bottom to where it makes that corner and goes up along the spine. Well, in that corner on the right side and the left is sharp stabbing pain with almost any movement in the ribs including breathing. Uh, it wraps around my chest. It feels like a hot poker going straight through me. Uh, it also runs up the spine to the neck, across the shoulder, down the arm. It wakes me up in my sleep. If I lie on the floor to relax my shoulders properly, um, you know, letting the shoulders roll back to their relaxed position. If you lie on the floor, you'll, you'll, and relax, you'll know exactly what I mean. Anyway, if I do that, I can't get back up off the floor. The pressure in those areas, the muscles needed for all the movement, oh, it's excruciating. Uh, now, post-surgery, post the surgeon tells me this is not uncommon. 
Uh, not one of those things I thought to ask about pre-surgery, uh, but this is not uncommon. Basically, the nerves are complaining about being stretched. Now, we had two collapsed discs, not completely, but collapsed discs. So the nerves had shortened their path. Uh, when they took out in the surgery, when they took out the, the, the disc material and put in spacer material for the fusion, it stretched those nerves out to their normal thing, and they're not happy about that. Uh, now, why it shows up in that area? That's a good question. Nobody seems to know. Even doctors, they, they just don't know. It just seems to be a recurring pain path for this. Thankfully, those usually resolve in one to three weeks or so. I hate that phrase, or so. Uh, and of course, I, do I need to tell you I'm not looking forward to the next couple of weeks? Oh, side note, did you know the pain path for thoracic outlet syndrome isn't always in the front of the shoulder? It can be in the back of the shoulder too. And three guesses as to where that pain path is. And of course, your first two guesses don't count. Sadly, that's actually a pain path I've been dealing with off and on since at least the early 80s, maybe longer. Yeah, after decades of this, it's, it's hard to remember for sure when and where it started. Um, but it's always been about this painful. It just never lasts this long. They triggered what I thought for years were nasty migraines until I found out migraines don't usually last that long. They can, but they usually don't. And before you ask, yes, I have sent questions through to my thoracic outlet surgeon on this, so um, we'll see. Uh, anyway, moving on, the, the second post-surgery area involves the esophagus. Now, to do the surgery, they go in through the front of the neck. And since my problems were on the left side, they went in on the right side as evidenced, you know, by the bandage. So because they had to move stuff out of the way, the muscles, the windpipe, the esophagus, all, all everything, all that stuff got stretched too, just like the nerves. So I have a knot on the right side of my sternum when I swallow, sometimes when I move. The knot is inflamed muscles complaining about being moved and stretched. And that runs up into my throat, down into my stomach, and sometimes even fires the nerves off in the back. It's obviously great fun. Uh, it turns out this is also common. Now, the good news is, as things move back to the normal position, this will go away. The bad news is, there's no time frame for this. Uh, it could be a few days, it could be several weeks, it's already been almost two. And to quote the surgeon, even months. And to be honest, they did tell me about this before surgery, but apparently I didn't understand what they meant and didn't ask good questions. Now, pro tip, if you're having surgery, ask lots of questions when you're about to have surgery. Uh, even if you think you understand what they're telling you, ask questions. There are no stupid questions, okay? Okay, uh, so short version, the shooting pain seems to be gone, so I'm calling this a win. Uh, hopefully that holds true long term. There are some very painful post-surgery issues in play that should resolve in a few weeks or so. Uh, but the dystonia problems are unchanged, which probably means a permanent determination of disability is likely. Yeah. Okay, well, now on to more encouraging stuff, channel news. Uh, we'll start with technical improvements. Now, you'll notice uh, the camera is on the other side of the desk from where it usually is. That's because we have a new microphone. We'll get to that in a minute, but uh, the, the first thing I want to talk about is a happy accident. Purely by accident, I discovered my recording settings were compatible to the video range of 720p. So it was going up on YouTube in the 600p range, and the audio recording rate was just as bad. The settings I was using came from a friend who had much lower system capacity than I do. Uh, he also only did streaming and when you're streaming, you do use lower settings than you would for recording and uploading, so his settings weren't actually bad. But being the noob that I am at all this, I had no idea. And it took over a year, clearly, to figure out what the differences were and why those were the wrong settings for me to be using. So this being the first video with the new settings, it should show up on YouTube in much better quality. Unfortunately, there are recordings already done and scheduled on YouTube with the old settings. So it'll be a week or so before the good settings show up there. Sorry, but I can't change that. And also, as I said, we have another microphone. And before you get too excited, it's just another budget USB microphone. It's not a higher quality microphone like an Elgato Wave or a HyperX or, you know, whatever. Uh, those are still just not in the budget. Uh, side note, if anybody feels generous, you're welcome to... Uh, no, I'm kidding. kidding. We, well, 
mostly kidding. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would not turn one down if anyone tried to give me one, uh, but I'm not asking for a, for such a donation. Uh, this one is actually a USB microphone. Now I know I call our other one a USB microphone, but it's actually an XLR microphone that we've been running in a 3.5 millimeter jack in the back of the computer. And since it's an XLR, that's why we had to go out and get the phantom power supply, which originally they said we didn't need, but we do. And, and we covered that in a different video. Uh, and the sound in, for that improved a lot when we got that phantom power supply. We're now running that microphone into a USB connection using an XLR to USB cable. So technically we now have two USB microphones. So back to the new microphone. I got it for two reasons. Uh, first, it gives me a second microphone to use during live streams. Now, one of the things we learned last time during the, uh, the fireworks mania live stream is that without a second microphone, there's no way to monitor and react to comments because you can't get to the other computer. It was not intentional. Come to find out we actually did have some comments and my sincere apologies for seeming to ignore you. Like I said, it was not intentional. Anyway, this new microphone will let our live stream partner monitor the chat on our backup computer. You know, the beast from last, uh, the last video that we did, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Z 400 with the GTX 950 that we rescued. Uh, that's on, actually on the other side of the room. So now he can take care of that, which leads to us to the second reason, which is really kind of just an extension of the first with both microphones going into USB connections, I can control them in OBS. This will let my broadcast partner be part of the gameplay, the discussion while they monitor the chat on the other side of the room. So our live stream mistakes were like a giant learning opportunity for us here at the Chartreuse Leprechaun. We, we really appreciate you sticking with us through this learning curve. Uh, like most learning curves, this one's not likely to end. So, you know, kind of hang with us. Um, yeah, uh, so this particular segment, we're talking about technical stuff. I'm going to end that with a comment about the number of videos we create here at the Chargers Leprechaun. My ability to record gameplay, oh, is much less limited than my ability to edit and publish. Oh, oh boy. That was not good. Uh, anyway, if all I did was record video, I got a little too animated there. I apologize. If all I did was record video and publish what I record straight, I could do a lot more content. I'm not that good at creating, you know, gameplay content yet. Uh, <clears throat> oh. Wow. Anyway, I spend twice as much time on editing and publishing than I do on recording. And on any given day, I can record or I can edit either one on a given, you know, doing both severely aggravates the dystonia problems. And I'm limited to about two, if I stretch maybe three hours, uh, and that's not two hours straight, that's two hours total of either one or any or combination on any given day. Now, if I had an editor, I could do all, put all my time into video recording, which would mean more content, but I can't pay an editor for the time they would be putting in or at all really. Uh, and given the medical situation and disability likely to be permanent, uh, yeah, I got to look into generating some alternate revenue streams so I can afford an editor. Uh, I also need more income than disability is paying. So when, not if, when this situation changes, I will likely be putting up more content. Now for the section I'm sure you've all been waiting for and probably skipped ahead to game news and plans. Uh, this I need your input for. So please leave your thoughts and comments, uh, in the, you know, uh, down below. Uh, I hope y'all are enjoying the newest series, uh, Subnautica Below Zero. Uh, as I said, a couple of months back, I really wanted to start this on our anniversary, you know, back when we finished Stranded Deep. Uh, but Subnautica Below Zero 1.0 with the actual ending of the game included wasn't being released until mid-May. So I stalled for time. With a short series of Besiege, I just didn't tell y'all that's what I was doing. And I'm hoping we can get back to Besiege another time. I'm really interested in seeing more of that game. I mean, creative destruction. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, and second thought, don't, don't answer that. Don't, no, no, don't, don't. Yeah, please don't answer that. Don't, no. 
Uh, anyway, let me know your thoughts on returning Besiege in the comments. Speaking of fun games, what do you think of the new Aim Lab format? Now, admittedly, I've only done the one video in that format, but what do you think? Uh, I'm still doing the four specific exercises during the week, or I will be once I get back to gaming, you know, the whole post-surgery get better thing. Um, fortunately, that's all right-handed stuff, and I, so I get the brain training without risking the left hand. But according to the Steam page, AimLab has full controller support. I'm looking forward to checking that out. Uh, anyway, as I said in AimLab episode four, the new plan for the monthly video is just to, well, experiment with all the other stuff in this game. And let's face it, there's a lot that we haven't even touched on yet. Uh, so give me your exercise and scenario suggestions. Uh, capacity is one that was suggested to me in the AimLab Discord, and that turned out to be pretty wonderful. I'm hoping you guys can find some more for me to try out, and I will get to all of your suggestions. It may take a while, depending on how many you give me, but I will get to all of them. Oh, and the guy who suggested capacity, after watching episode four, he followed up with suggestions on setting changes. So if you have any of those, send that too. Uh, yeah, just feel free to suggest away on that. Uh, that said, what do you all think about Random Game Saturdays? I didn't really plan for that to be a series. I just kind of morphed into its own thing when I cut one episode of Leprechaun Stories. Uh, and to be honest, doing random games is a lot of fun. I may never go back to Leprechaun Stories on Saturdays. Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm, there's some schedule changes I'm contemplating for the channel, like I had the thought of putting random games on another day, like move that to Wednesday and push the Leprechaun stories to Friday and the Friday series day to Saturday, leaving Monday unchanged. It's hard to believe I'm actually thinking this, but if we leave the current Monday series alone, I'm considering Leprechaun stories for Sundays, you know, teaser videos for the Monday videos. Um, that's a huge question mark though. What I'm already doing is, is pretty much maxing out what I can do. So, I don't know. Of course, we could also move random games to Monday, something light and enjoyable to start off the week. Leprechaun stories on Wednesdays, games on Friday, the game series on Friday and Saturday. Uh, like I said, let me know what you all think about all that in the comments below. Um, I want the good suggestions, the bad suggestions, the indifferent comments, all that stuff, by the way. And of course, I've got scheduling ideas to consider. Uh, if you've got scheduling ideas to consider, I've already given you mine, pass those along. Uh, I absolutely want them. And as always, send me your game suggestions. While we are limited to how much content we can produce and publish, we're always looking for good games to work with, especially right now, games for random for Random Game Saturday. Uh, in that series, I do roughly 30 minutes of gameplay for just about anything. Uh, so I can't guarantee we'll get to any and every game you suggest, but we'll absolutely try. And, and we do that for everything. For example, uh, our Fallout 4 series was a suggestion. And just a heads up, there's another suggested game that's waiting in the uh, to go into the rotation. So I'm not going to give you the title because, as you know, I like springing surprises on y'all. Uh, at the same time, I've turned down a couple of suggestions uh, for pure horror games because well, I just don't do horror games. I don't mind dark themes, but I don't do heavy hardcore horror. So just be aware that we really do consider your suggestions around here. So yeah, send me your suggestions. Send, uh, yeah, absolutely, please and thank you. And last, in this season of gay pride celebrations and all of that, I wanna clarify where I stand on diversity. I get asked from time to time how I feel about gender and race and sexes and religions and all that fun stuff. And usually it's said with the assumption that because I am white and or male and or Christian and or whatever else, I have all kinds of racist and insert whatever type of phobic belief and sexist this or that and so on. Can I just say I hate all those assumptions? They disgust me. It, I don't care if you're making an assumption about someone because of their skin color, their economic status, their sex, their beliefs, your, your assumptions disgust me. The assumption someone hates you because of X, whatever X is, instead of simply believing differently than you do is so bigoted and hateful in and of itself. It's, it, it's, is there hatred out there? Oh yeah, only a fool would say otherwise. Does that mean that you are hated 
by everyone who believes differently about X? No. And we'd be foolish to think otherwise. Um, yeah, okay. It really is pretty simple. The best way I can describe where I stand on this goes back to when I coached youth ice hockey from like 1997 to, I want to say 2008 or 2009. The most hesitant hockey player on my first team also became a most aggressive checking forward and later a star defenseman, all because of I answered one question in the locker room. The best two goalies who played for me were girls. One of the best defensive forwards I ever had, I would describe him as a master at taking the puck away from people in a neutral zone. Well, he was a rookie from Colombia. One of the best checking forwards I ever coached was from Pakistan. Lots of players considered and called him, quote, the angry Arab, end quote. That's pretty mean. That's pretty ugly. And that was the kids that were doing that. But it was because of his on ice play. He did not have stick discipline, which is common in a lot of younger and newer players. Well, with a little targeted coaching, that became a thing of the past really quick. He became a solid player. One of my most amazing defensemen was also the smallest player who ever played for me. When I made the introductory phone calls, you know, hey, hi, I'm the coach and we're the team and, you know, we're, we're our first meeting is blah, blah, blah. His mom told me because of his size, his coaches always played him at forward but he loved playing defense. Now, this was a spring season where they just take whoever signs up, throw them on teams, and you get two practices in 12 games, and they schedule it kind of weird. And in this case, our first meeting was a game. And I'm going around the locker room asking names, confirming positions, all that fun stuff. And when he came in the locker room, he sat away from everybody else and stared at the floor. And I went over and I asked his name and what position he played, and he kept his head down. He didn't even look me in the eye. And he said, my coaches always play me at forward. And I said, okay, but what do you want to play? And his head came up. He looked me square in the eye. His, his eyes had fire in him. And in a passionate voice, this small 11 year old kid said defense. And I said, okay, you got it. And that's where I put him. Now, to be clear, because of his mom, I already had him slotted on my roster as playing defense. And I'll also be honest, meeting this kid, I was worried. He was really small. Now, I coached 11 to 13 year olds, and this was one of those kids that hadn't hit their growth spurt yet. Someone that small should normally be a liability at defense. But I watched that kid stand toe to toe with players my size. Uh, and I'm at the time, I'm just under six feet and 190 pounds. So the kids he was playing against were maybe 140, 150, but he could muscle them out from in front of the net. Ah, damn it. Ah, sorry about that. Um, a few years later, I was, I was coaching an inline hockey league and the man who ran it was African-American. And he could also coached one of the teams. Brilliant, dedicated guy. And I learned a lot from him about the game, about people. His sons were all forwards and phenomenal players. We dreaded playing against them because he was that good of a coach and his kids were that good as players. They were all strong Christians too. And one of the boys actually went on to be an Olympic level swimmer. Now, don't get me wrong, I made Oh God, I made a lot of mistakes. I said things I shouldn't have. I did things I shouldn't have. I learned more by accident and through mistakes than I ever want to remember. But the important part is that I learned and I grew. When it's all said and done, what I learned comes down to this. I don't care what your size is. I don't care what your sex is, where you're from, your skin color, your economic status. None of that matters. If you can do the job, you get out there and you do the job. I will back you all the way. All I require in return is you respect others. Yeah, you get to state your beliefs, your position. So does everyone else. You can disagree with anything and so can everyone else, but you do it respectfully. You don't do it by bullying. If you disrespect or bully others, you'll get called out for it. I've suspended players for it. I've recommended people get fired for it. Uh, and if others are disrespecting or bullying you, they get called out for it. I've done that with friends and coworkers. <laughs> In my pre-Christ days, I even called a guy out for it in a casino in Vegas back in the 80s. I was a mass of contradictions back then. Oh, God. But in my heart, I knew what was right, and however imperfectly, I would lived that out. But all that said, I also expect you to do that for me. I've had parents call me out for not enforcing rules fairly and evenly. Uh, at work, my boss has called me out for things. My kids have done it to me. Uh, many times, not all, but many times, more than I care to count or admit they were right and I deserved it 
and I changed for the better because of it. But understand this, all those things, skin color, economics, sex, and all that, those are externals. Externals aren't what matters. The internals are what matters. The attitude of your heart is what matters. Even Jesus respected authority. Yes, he spoke out against authority. He did it very firmly, but he did it respectfully. You may, you can ask about the time he cleared the money changers from the temple with a whip. Well, in that instance, whose authority was he supposed to respect? He was responding to a higher authority than just men. He, the plus the scribes, scribes and Pharisees really couldn't deny the charges he accused them of. I mean, let's face it, they turned the temple of God into nothing more than a money show. Uh, is it wrong for authority to apply justice unfairly based on, insert your metric here, color, sex, whatever? Yeah, no, it's, it's wrong. Of course it is. But the question is always, whose authority are we respecting? Are we accepting the punishment for something we did? Or are we denying any responsibility? I mean, we actually did it, right? And there's punishment for doing it, right? Well, consider this. Jesus respected authority even submitting himself to the death on the cross, because biblically, that was what the law prescribed for claiming to be God. Even though it was true, he still submitted to the penalty. Can we see this, say the same thing when we're speaking out or protesting? Can we? Are we respecting authority at that level? In the end, things, everything, bullying, disrespectfulness, it really is that simple. So, uh, yeah, for those of you who've asked, I hope that clarifies everything. And for those of you that didn't ask, yeah, I hope that clarifies everything for you too. And I think that's it for now. Uh, pretty much sure I covered everything. I want to thank you for spending your time with us here today at the Chartreuse Leprechaun. We really do appreciate it. Please leave us a comment on today's video, what you liked, what you didn't like, and of course, all the stuff we asked about, game ideas, channel improvement ideas, suggestions for playing Aim Lab, Patreon suggestions. Honestly, we'll take whatever feedback you want to give us because, you know, we need your input to get better. And we'd like to be able to provide what you want to see. So best we can anyway. Uh, also, as I said, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Set yourself up for notifications. so You don't miss anything around here. Check out our merch page. The link's in the description below. But above all, always, always, always remember, if you see it, and you can't quite explain it. You can be sure the leprechaun did it. Now you have yourselves a great day, a great week, and we will see you here next time on the Chartreuse Leprechaun. Bye-bye.